Freunde des Laserguckenlands. Let's go. Ähm, ja. <lacht> Voll die gute Anmoderation. Also sillyhuhn.com Alternativ, also zur Quelle des Tages connecten wir mal über die IP-Adresse. Ähm, ich weiß, wo bin ich denn? Wo haben wir denn aufgehört? Ah ja. Ah ja. Ich erinnere mich. Ähm, ja, weiter geht's mal wieder mit John Hammonds äh, Cyber Security Skills with CTFs Video von dem Free, freecodecamp.org Channel. Wir sind jetzt bei 3 Stunden und 6 Minuten. Das Video hat den Titel Improve Cyber Security Skills with CTFs Pico CTF Walkthrough 2018. Ähm, ja, und wir spielen hier auf äh, dem Anarchie-Server Laserguckenland. Ähm, IP habt ihr ja gesehen, hier könnt ihr sie nochmal haben, 1.9.2.1.7.1.3.4, alternativ geht auf die Domain silihun.com. Ähm, dann würde ich mal sagen, let's go. We are... Let's check out what EBP <coughs> minus 0x4 is. 33. Wieso schreibt er eigentlich den Assembler Code in Python nach? Anstatt einfach den Assembler-Code auszuführen. Was, was verstehe ich hier nicht? Okay, ich hatte sicher irgendeine Mission gerade, aber ich habe sie voll vergessen. Hm. Okay, that only happens once, so that must be why. Oh, of course, it has to go back to part B once part A is done. We just didn't have that procedural loop in there. So we can do a while one here. Actually, just to loop it, because we know that that's just going to return back to that other part B test. So once we print EAX, or once we actually have that else be returned true, let's print EAX and then return. So now we'll break, actually. We're not inside of a function, so we'll stop looping. So we have 120 as our final answer. Okay, let's see what that is in hex. On this, 0x78. Perfect. Sounds like a plausible answer. Let's go ahead and submit it. And we got it right. Okay, cool. So all that we really did there was recreate this assembly code in Python. So it's something we can easily kind of understand and manage. We stepped through it just with our comments on the side, and we just tried to recreate something that we can run very easily. Uh, maybe we could do this with NASM if you just wanted to compile it and run it if yeah. you are that much of an assembly guy. Sweet, more power to you. Uh, but I just figured, okay, I'll step through it and try to understand a little bit. Uh, the while wow one thing or the loop is interesting. Remember, because we immediately jumped to part B, and das then if it's less than or equal to A, a ich blase mir hier mal ein bisschen die Ohren weg, damit man bei euch noch was hört. Was ist das Wasser hier nervig? Flag. 
What the fuck is that thing here? The heck? Is this a falle? Schafe sind zu fett, um da reinzufallen, oder? Das ist ja super funny. Python. Got the string that we need, and we will 
tack that onto our payload. Great. Now when we run this, I get the flag. And we're still getting a segmentation bump, that's fine, but we're running enough of the code that we need to. So now that we have our payload, let's go ahead and redirect that into payload.txt. And I suppose mm, we can actually just copy this because we're going to need it once we're on the shell server. So let's go ahead and connect to it. SSH.sh to log in. Um, see if I can remember my password here. Sweet, we're right. Um, I'm going to paste this down below so I have it because I need to copy and paste this location on the shell server. So we can quick and easy just change directory there. Great. Now I'm in that directory and we would be able to read the real flag.txt. Obviously we can't just straight up read it because we don't have that user's privileges and that's why it has that uh, set GSID and all that other crap the main function so we can inherit their uh, privileges and permissions. So since we have our payload, let's go ahead and copy that. Let's echo that out. So there it is. And now let's pipe it into the vulnerable binary. And we're given the flag, just like that. I know it looks a little bit of a mess here, but you can see it. Pico CTF, addresses are easy, some hex bytes. So just like that, we have our flag. All right, let's go ahead and submit this. Hope that made a little bit of sense. It's everything that you already know, right? From watching the other videos, you know that above the, the stack frame, right, the base pointer, plus four, the bytes following the, the address of where you're going or where you're jumping on the function here, is your return address, which we can set to be anything or garbage, right? And then you have the arguments that follow. So arg1, dead, dead beef, and then arg2, dead code, we're just supplying again in the Lendian because we need it in the format the binary can read and understand. So, cool. Let's go ahead and make that the flag file. <laughs> no longer the please subscribe, but please do that. That'd be awesome. Join our Discord server. And we can mark that challenge as complete. Another one done. <coughs> this is the Caesar Cipher 2 challenge. It says, can you help us decrypt this message? We believe it's a form of the Caesar Cipher. You can find the, cy the cipher text also at this location on the shell server. We're given a download, so we can go ahead and just simply download that. I've got a directory created for us to work in. You should do the same. And we're just given simple ASCII text. So let's check out what that file is. And it's a lot of characters. So normally when we see a Caesar cipher, and you can Google it if you haven't heard of it before, um, but it's a pretty simple and very common like form of classic cryptography or whatever baby stuff. <laughs> so normally you'd expect to see it all in the range of regular English letters, like A to Z, 26 letters in the alphabet, stuff like that. In this case, we're working with some punctuation, right? We've got underscores and colons and braces and crap like that. So we know something is up. We can still work with this, right? Because we understand the ASCII table or the range of characters that we could possibly work with on our computer. So let's create a simple ape.py or a Python script to work with it. I call it ape because I'm just throwing stuff at stuff and seeing what works. So I'm going to use a context manager because people yell at me until I use them. And it says, with open ciphertext, the name of the file, as handle, we can say handle.read will actually be our content, what we're actually working with. Now, let's go ahead and loop through all of the possible permutations for this Caesar cipher, right? We know not just 26 letters, we're essentially brute forcing, right? What could the possible key be? It's a small, it's a small brute force space, right? Because it's normally 26 for a regular Caesar cipher, but for this upgraded level, we know we've just got the 255 characters that are part of the ASCII table. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's say for I in range 255, because that's how many are in the ASCII table. And if you don't know, don't know what I'm saying when I'm talking about the ASCII table, you are given um, a notion of it in the hints if you want to go ahead and Oh, that sieht dann aus wie eine Trick. Das ist cool, oder? <lacht> so, just characters represented as a character, also in hex, decimal, etc. But there are 255. So, Fake trap. Let's go ahead and continue our script. For I in range 255, we can create a new string, or just what to, ho to hold the string that we're going to be working with, the new one that we generate once we've done the Caesar type for operation to it. And then we'll actually go ahead and loop through the characters that are inside of our uh, ciphertext. So for C in content, C being character, right, what we can do is we can do new string dot append, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the character rendition, or CHR, of 
the ordinal value of the current character that I'm looking at, so that will convert it to the number on the ASCII table, and then I will add on an i, so the current index or iterator that we're looking at in our 255 loop here, and so that's doing the shift, that's doing the actual scissor cipher operation, but we've got to put it back in the range of 255 in case it goes greater than that. So we can do that by simply wrapping around, right, using the modulus operator. So that should simply work for us. Um, we want to do that inside of our character string here, our character function here. So make sure that 255 wrap is inside the CHR function. And then we will close that in 10 seconds. So cool. Now, at the very, very end, we can print out the joined version of our new string. And let's go ahead and see what this gives us. If I go ahead and run Python ape.py, there's a lot of garbage, right? Because we're going to get a lot of those non-printable characters that are still present in the ASCII table. If you want to clear this up, what we can do is, if my terminal will ever come back, okay, I think I broke it, whatever. Get to Pico, get to Caesar Cypher 2, zoom in a little bit more. Let's actually run our ape script, but pipe it to strings, right? So now we have all of the printable strings that we can work with. And we can be pretty confident, also because we can see it right there, that we have the flag by grepping for Pico, right? For Pico CTF. And then we just have the flag here, Caesar ciphers just aren't secure. So, kind of neat, kind of cool, right? We can modify our script. We can say, if Pico is actually in this, Pico is in the string that we're given here, we can print it out. Let's not do this twice, so let's just say new string equal that after we're done looping. So we can print new string and just put it in that conditional. Now when we run Python 8, all we get is our flag, so we can change this to a get flag script instead, right? Because I like to consolidate our answers, mark it executable, and then we're good. Direct it to a flag.txt file. Let's throw it in our clipboard so we can go ahead and submit it. And done. 250 points up more on the scoreboard. We can mark this challenge as complete. And that is that. Simple Caesar Cipher, but just expanding our search, not just using the 26 characters you'd expect in the alphabet, but going through the full range of printable characters or data that we can use. Hmm, nice. What's going on YouTube? This is another CTF challenge video write-up for the challenge Got to Learn LibC from Pico CTF 2018. So it says this program gives you the addresses from system calls. Can you get a shell? You can find the problem here on the shell server and we're given the source code as well. So let's go ahead and wget these things. I've just created a directory for us to work in and we can download the program and the source. So let's take a look at the source code. Let's see what we're working with here. Looks like we have some regular includes, some definitions for the buffer size and flag size. Uh, we have a useful string in sh, so just a shell command uh, that you can see on Linux, not bash, but simply shell. Uh, and it says maybe this can be used to respond oh to a shell. Cool. That is going to be useful for us. We have a vulnerable function here, reads in a buffer, supposedly it says a yeah. string, and then it does not check the boundaries on our buffer, so we can like go through with a buffer overflow attack and exploit says thanks, exiting now, and then that's about it. Okay, the main function sets our privileges to the uh, next user or whoever actually owns this on the shell server. It says this prevents Finisage from dropping privileges. Okay, handy, because that means we will end up wanting to spawn a shell with this. And then it gives us some useful addresses. It gives us the address for puts, flush, read, write, and useful string. And then it lets us run the vulnerable function. Okay, so let's take a look at what we really have when we run the binary here. Let's mark this as executable and try and run it. It says here are some useful addresses, puts 0xf7, dc, etc, etc, same thing for all these. They're all, all seem to be in the same kind of format, and we can say with that f7, that is very likely on the stack, or the location of the function kind of in memory as we're running the program. It also gives us the useful string, which is probably just going to be, I'm probably wrong about this, like, it's, it's not the dot data or the dot DSS section, it's, it's, it's one of those, but that will remain constant, that should not change. I think if we run this
this again and again. Maybe ASLR is not on, or uh, I'm, I'm wrong about how I'm finding these addresses or why they do not change, but they do not, thankfully, for us in this case. So what we can use and what we can take advantage of is actually some, oh, it looks like the useful string address changes. Maybe that's being sort of that's fine, it's still something we can pull out because we're running the binary. So, what we do want to be able to do is actually use a return to libc attack. And you can look this up online and find plenty of guides that do a much better job of explaining it than I do. Um, but if you want to see it happen, this is how we can go about doing it here. So, because we're given some of the addresses here, normally you'd be able to find these in like a memory leak or some corruption in the, in the program that will allow us to find these memory addresses we can determine the address of system, or like the C function system that will run a system command. And we're, in the case that we want, run bin sh, or a useful string to spawn a shell. So since we can figure this out by determining just an offset between one of these functions that is, is part of libc and the function, the offset, the address address for system in libc, we can calculate where it really is when this binary runs, or when we run the program. So maybe that doesn't make sense right now, but let's walk through and do it here. I'm going to open up the vulnerable program in GDB, and we can want to just examine puts, right? Puts can be the function that we want to choose to actually determine where the system is in the program. Uh, it's not going to give me anything yet, because it hasn't ran the program. So if I just hit, like, run, we could break it main or something if we ever want to. Just, just in fact, let's do that. D main, hit run, and now that we've broken, we have all of the functions still initialized, so I can just simply x puts, and it's at that location, right? Okay, uh, let's just take note of this. Uh, nano, or let's, let's sublimate it online. Get something moving here. Let's create a script, user bin, environment python. Let's say gdb puts equal that. And now let's go ahead and find the location of system. So that's at this address. Okay? So now we can find GDB system. Great. So let's determine the offset, right? We'll say offset will equal the GDB puts minus GDB system. And now this offset, we can apply that, which is using simple math, right, to go ahead and determine where that real system function is when we run the binary because we're seeing that leaked address for puts or whatever any of these system calls that we particularly want when we're running the program. So now let's go ahead and run the program, right? Let's uh, clear out some of these and just work on our script here. I'm going to use pwn tools because it's awesome. So let's say elf can equal elf, pwn.elf, of dot slash vuln. So if I were to look at it, now I have the binary that I can handle and work. Cool. So what I could do is now oh determine a process for it. So let's do elf.process, uh, that will just be p. So it will run the binary just fine for us. If I run Python 8, it's going to start and stop the process. Let's go ahead and work with it. Let's do print p.receive. And it tells us, okay, here are some das useful as Falle let's funktionieren, call this prompt, oder? so we can go ahead and work with it. And let's print out prompts, right? I don't know. And now let's carve out the information. Das let's use regular expressions. And let's do re.findall, because I think that's pretty nice, good hack. re.findall puts location with our prompt. And let's see what we got here. Okay, it is finding the address just fine for us. Great. Let's say puts address, or we can just call it puts, that's fine. And let's say bin bash, let's find the location of the useful string. Just carve that out. So we can print puts, make sure we get that just fine, and print bin bash, make sure we get that just fine. Or bin sh, whatever. Great, okay, carve them out just fine. So now we can determine an offset that we've already calculated, right? We can use the offset to determine the real location of system by simply saying system can equal the puts location that we're getting. Let's go ahead and convert that from hex, right? Because that is uh, int 16. Because that's giving it to us as a string. We want it to get as an actual number. And let's go ahead and subtract the 
offset. So now I got system, and let's print out the hex of that to see if it's a pretty good candidate, right, for where system could really be in the binary. Looks like it works just fine for us. Okay, so now that we know the location of system, we can use that buffer overflow attack technique to go ahead and exploit this binary and call system and run bin bash, get a shell. So let's do that. We want to overflow this. Um, let's test in the command line. Let's go ahead and do Python taxi print. What's the buffer here? 148. Okay, let's crank that. Let's do A times uh, maybe 156. Think about numbers here. 52, 56, yeah. Let's go 160. Let's see what we cover. Crank that into long. No seg fault. Let's go 64. Jeez, about 80. What? Does it not? Even echoing this correctly? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, that's totally my fault. I'm sorry. Now we should totally get a sec fault. All right, sweet. 160. Let's check out D message now. Okay, 4141. Let's do 156, and then add in PDB. Determine that is the. Okay, great. That is the offset. So we want now our payload equal a times 156, and then we want the address of the function that we want to go ahead and jump to, right? So we need that in little endian, and that's why we have the pwn install, or pwn tools. So we can use p32 of system, payload plus equals pwn32 of system. We need a return address following that, right? So that can be junk four letters because that's just the size that we need, and then we can use payload plus equals that useful string. But remember, it's got to be in Blandium, so bin bash, or I suppose bin sh is the proper name. Great. So now we've got our payload. Okay, let's do go ahead and send this to the program, right? Let's do p.sendline payload, and then let's make it interactive now that we've actually sent the payload and exploited it, supposedly. So let's go p interactive. That sounds really funny to say. Let's go p interactive. All right, uh, we can run our script. And okay, it broke something. Cannot convert argument to integer. What? Oh, bin sh is still. number and not a string. We don't need to do that in our system calculation anymore. We don't need a system like that anymore either. So now we run this, fingers crossed, still have an issue. What is the problem? System. Oh, Which option we don't spawn for biota. We still in. fast wieder vorbeigelaufen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I didn't fill up the instruction pointer. I always do that. I always misread this portion when I should really be looking at the instruction pointer that follows. So let's change this to 60 and let's see how that works. Maybe, hopefully, please. Run our ape script. Okay, cool. We don't get another file. I can ls and we have a shell. All right. So we are successfully running shell or SH. So now we can use the same attack script in our actual, like, on, on the shell server, right? Do it for real. So let's dot SSH, get over there, enter my password, and let's jump to that location. 
And one awesome thing about Pico CTF, like props to them, is that they can I can I write in here? Let's make a home directory thing. Oh boy, make directory. Sweet, not. Okay, let's copy all of those things into here. Can I do that? Nope, don't have flag. Okay, let's create a solid link on tech s this thing flag. Flag dot text into this directory. Okay, cool. So I can't read it still, but I can work with bone and bone scene. So let's create our attack.py in a file now that we have permission to write in. And let's go ahead and paste all this information in. So awesome thing about Pico CTF is that they actually have all of these uh, like attack tools and stuff we want. I think Radar 2 is actually installed in this. Oh, guess not. <laughs> but but Pwn Tools is certainly installed uh, and we can use those on the shell server. So let's go ahead and run Python attack, it starts our program, and we fail. Why is that? Maybe we can run GDB and change these variables. Maybe it's just the shell server specifically. Let's try and run GDB vuln, run it, and then let's X system. Take note of this. And X puts. Take note of this. Now let's modify our script to use these values. system is different. Ah. Okay. Now let's see how we do. Python attack. Sweet. We have a shell. Let's check out flag.txt. Still no. What? Oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe I'm an idiot. I probably, yeah, I have suddenly retained all of these um, permissions and that's not cool. Let's change our attack script once again to not just use this, not just use our binary the one in our directory as the uh, real program that we're trying to run, but instead use the one at that location. So nano attack.py, and then rather than using pwn.alpha in the current directory, let's do it at the real problem. So now, <laughs> fingers crossed. All right, can I now read flag.txt? Yes, I can. Awesome. That was cool. I hope you liked that one. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, hopefully I didn't breeze through it too much or I didn't go into too many weird tangents or say too many stupid things that it totally derailed what you were trying to learn. But that is the attack for a return to libc like MIDI technique, right? Uh, you can, if you have a memory leak or if you can find the address of some function in the binary while the binary is running, you can calculate where system is going to be in libc. And then you can go ahead and run system with some strings you can probably dig out or carve out of the binary. In this case, Pico is very nice to us and they just straight up gave us a string for bin sh. And awesome, now you've got a shell because you can call system if you've got an attack where you can control the IP or the instruction pointer. Call system, give the argument to run a shell command, run bash maybe, and then you've got a compromised system in a cool case. So let's take note of this flag.txt for real. There it is. Let's go ahead and submit it. 250 points. Not a whole lot of solves. So, some good learning. Some good learning that we just did there. Let's move that to a completed challenge, and we are done. This challenge is called RSA Mad Libs in the Cryptography category. It says, we ran into some weird puzzles we think may mean something. Can you help me solve one? Connect with this netcat command, which we can copy and paste, and I'll go ahead and start to work with in our terminal here. So, looks like it gives us some information. Uh, a strange hexadecimal number. Uh, hello, welcome to RSA Mad Libs. Keep young children entertained since well, never. Tell us how to fill in the blanks or it's even possible to do so. Everything input and output is decimal, not hex. So, we're given a Mad Lib with Q and P, and we're going to need the following N. Is this possible, yes or no? So, I've done a lot of RSA stuff before, but uh, let's just kind of get the RSA Wikipedia page up and with us. So, if you wanted to follow along, you kind of could if you haven't seen this before. So, it is a method of cryptography, but it's really just a lot of math and equations. So, for key generation, it actually ends up using with keys uh, P and Q, and those are distinct prime numbers. Uh, 
n is in fact p times q. So in this case, we can just simply multiply them. What I'm going to do is actually go ahead and create a script for this. Let's do ape.py, and I'll put it down here. So let's go ahead and user bin environment python. Let's get own, because I'm going to use that to go ahead and connect this stuff. Uh, we can go ahead and connect, or at least just copy and paste this stuff here. So I'll have oh my god, you can fight that the bio, though. Nah, aber Gravel. Und Eisen. Ja, Eisen habe ich auf der Reihe, okay. Passt. Passt. Das wäre es jetzt gewesen, Leute, oder? Das wäre ein Gigaflop. Okay, das funktioniert. Oh, habe ich einen Knopf gedrückt? Ah. Ob das jetzt nicht mehr schwer genug ist. Jo. Ich darf echt nicht an meine Maus kommen. Oh Mann, hey. Okay. Okay, laut meinen Berechnungen muss ich bis minus 30.100 laufen. 
Und ja, minus 47 auf der x-Achse. So circa. Das sind so die letzten Koordinaten, die ich so gefunden habe. Und dann äh, finden wir die Items wieder. Das wäre doch was. Okay. Was, wo im Browser drückt ihr das? Classic hatte, seid nochmal. Okay, next thing we need to know the totient of n. Okay, so the totient of n is just p minus 1 that quantity times q minus 1 that quantity. And you can find that over here as you read more about RSA. So let's go ahead and determine that information. Let's do, because that only happens because these are prime. So, mal sehen, ob der Spaß hier schwer genug ist. Ja. Ja gut, ich kann es mit dem erschweren und dann ist es sehr, sehr safe. Sache. 
don't actually have d. Can we determine d when we factor n? Let's try and factor n with factor db again. Nope, we cannot. Okay, this is not feasible in our case. And that tells us, great, we can move on. S.sendLine, no. And now we have p and q and e. We're going to need the following d. Okay, now that we know d, uh, sorry, now that we know p and q, we can in fact calculate d. Because d is determined to be the totient of all those, right? The modular inverse. In fact, we'll go ahead and grab that. We will need um, from crypto uh, util number. That's built in, I believe. Maybe it's not. You might have to install like PyCrypto or Python cryptography or cryptography just a bit. Uh, and let's import inverse. So we're given Q. Let's just create variables for this. It's like we are going to go ahead and time out. My bad. Was have I said? 30,000. So P and Q are given. <laughs> Now to determine D, we actually need to figure out what that totient is or what that phi variable is. And we did that just previously with Q minus 1 times P minus 1, those quantities. And then the D is in fact the inverse of phi mod E. I'm sorry, raised to E. Actually, I don't know about that. Um, determine D is actually E. Okay, so it's E inverse mod the totion. Uh, I was using the wrong variable. I mean, it was fine. Uh, so totion, just like filled out like that. So now that we've calculated D, we can S dot send line. Yes, that is feasible. And let's actually print it. Python. Great. Now we have an answer. S dot send line string of D. And we know that that is that. So which we can paste that in earlier or later. And let's go ahead and submit all of these just to move along. So we need to know N. Copy and paste that. Yes. Copy and paste this Q. No. That answer. The next one we know we do have an answer for. Oh. Okay, great. Oh, we did not calculate this. Crap. Let's throw that in Python. Get an answer for that. Hit enter. Yes. Remove that L at the very end. Yes, that's feasible. Fill in the ciphertext. Great. Next, we're going to need the plain text. That is not possible, as we determined. And then D is the final one, which we have determined is possible. And then let's paste it in here. Oh, we got it wrong. What? I copy pasted P, my bad. I didn't even copy the correct D. Fail. Oh, we need to import inverse in our Python shell that we're working with. So import from crypto util uh, number, import inverse. Now we can run that code. And D is not defined. Oh, because E is not defined. E should be this guy. Oh gosh, I pasted all that. <laughs> So E can equal that. That's the most common hex one that we end up working with. Okay, now let's copy and paste all this code, let Python run it. And now I have a D that I can actually submit. And it should be the correct answer. Great. Let's try this again. Okay. I know this is a very painful video, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, submit. Yes, submit. No, not feasible. Yes, submit. This one is yes, submit. Next one is not feasible. And now we need D, which we can calculate. Yes, paste that in. And now we need to figure out the plain.
plain text, all this, given all this information. Okay, let's do that. We know we can actually do the full decryption of RSA because we're given N and P. Okay, we can figure out what Q is then. Given N, given P, now let's go ahead and figure out Q can equal N divided by P. Let's take E to be the variable that we know. Submit that. C being our ciphertext. See if we can paste in. And now we can figure out the exact same thing. D, based off the totient, because we know P and Q. And now we can decrypt it where M can equal C raised to the power of D, all mod N, P modulus. Okay? Let's figure out what this is. Paste. Let's see what M is. We have this. say yes that is feasible let's submit it and I did not remove the you know, gosh darn it let's send yes and then let's send the string of M in our Python script that should be the last one that should be the last question since we are like doing a full decryption of RSA there so let's do s dot receive all and let's just print this out let's see if we can actually get a flag at the very end, so let's run Python ape, and yes, that is the last one. If you convert the last plain text to a hex number, then ask you, you'll find what you're searching for. Okay, great. So let's print m dot, actually we want to convert it to hex first, right? So we don't need to receive any of this, let's, let's just roll through it. That's hex. Now, oh, I'm printing something else up here. Let's slice off the two first two characters so that 0x gets removed, and there's no L to represent a long number at the very end, so we don't need to worry about that. Now we can decode it from hex, and we're given the flag. Awesome! You know the way to RSA. That is, again, the flag that we have already seen just from <laughs> ripping it from the top of the service, so kind of peculiar. At least I believe that is, yeah. Go ahead and find out one last time in Python. Dot decode hex. Yes, that is in fact the same flag. So <laughs> it gives us the flag right away just in hex. Um, but if you want to roll through all those RSA Mad Libs uh, using the procedure that I had done, you mm. certainly can. But hey, flag's a flag, whatever, right? If you wanted to, since all that service is really just giving you the RSA decryption stuff, you don't even need to communicate with the service once you have all that numbers. Uh, you can just make a get flag script where you just calculate that. But that's kind of handy to have this information if you want to just save it as a service. This can be our get flag.py file, and we can mark that as executable. I believe we can do context level equals critical, and then that should. Maybe I'm always forgetting that syntax, but yeah, context not right. Meh. Oh, not context dot log level. That's what it is, I think. Own dot context log level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So that removes those opening connection and closed connection information. So if you just want to run get flag, that should do it for you. Let's redirect that to flag dot text. Let's save it to our clipboard so we can submit it. Let's move this challenge to be complete. And let's go ahead and submit it for some 250 points. I dig it. All right, cool, correct. Sweet. This challenge is called Be Quick or Be Dead 2. It's the sequel to the previous Be Quick or Be Dead challenge. Uh, it's worth 275 points in the reversing category, and it only has 537 solves. So that's not a lot, and this is now like mid-December, so it's been a while since Pico has actually finished. Uh, but a lot of people have still worked on it, but it's still not a lot compared to the surrounding challenges. So 
The challenge bomb here is as you enjoy this music even more, which is again another link to the Iron Maiden song. Uh, another executable beat Quaker beat at two shows up. Can you run this fast enough? Uh, you can find the executable here on the shell server, but we're given the binary to go ahead and download. So let's go ahead and play with this. I will move over to uh, my directory here. We can W get it. And this is actually the first time that I am like recording on my new computer. I just bought a Dell XPS uh, 15. So hopefully this video won't suck when I'll be fumbling around on the keyboard. Uh, when we try and run this binary, it gives us a banner, tells us it's calculating the key, and tells us you need a faster machine, bye bye. So we can't do anything, right? We have no interaction with this binary. Uh, we don't know entirely what it's doing. Maybe if you wanted to, we could L trace or S trace some of the stuff. I don't know if that's, yeah, that's okay. Printing out the banner, getting a SIG alarm, so the alarm handlers is occurring. Looks like it's trying to run that function after three seconds. So let's break this down, right? I'm going to open it up in Hopper, which if you don't have it, you can go to hopperapp.com and download a free version. I think the actual pro version or the, the licensed is only $90. I bought it and it's actually pretty nice. I don't have the license already set up on this, in this machine just yet, but. Let's open it up and control shift O, not just O. Where is the binary? There we go. Okay, so on the left hand side, you can see all the procedures here, and I've got the main function uh, locked on. And once we jump to it, we can hit Alt and Enter to view kind of the pseudocode decompilation, right? So it looks like the main function will display the header, which if I click on here, will display B quicker B dead 2, tries to show out those equal signs as a little horizontal line. That's nice. It sets the timer for us. Uh, looks like it has a disclaimer if something goes wrong, but otherwise it will set an alarm for three seconds. And uh, we see an alarm handler function over off the left here, and that will simply say you need a faster machine, and it will exit. So looks like after those three seconds are up, we can't do anything. But if I go back to the main function, after that alarm handler is, is created and set, it moves on. So it tries to run get key, which as you can see, right, because it, it told us calculating key, and then it calls this function calculate key. And then once it's completed, it will go ahead and spit out the flag. Looks like it uses decrypt flag as a function, so that key is probably very important. Uh, we will probably need to keep that intact if we are actually modifying or changing up this binary. So let's see how it does that. In the calculate key function, Looks like it's calling this thing called fib with an argument 0x422, so the hex number uh, 422. If I click on fib, reading through this just even superficially, you can kind of assume this looks like the Fibonacci sequence, right? Uh, recursive function with if it's less than 1 or about 0, it will return itself. Otherwise, keep calling it with variables being subtracted here. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. It is past 0x422. If we check out what that number is, and your number might be different, right? In my case, it's 1,058. We need to get the 1,058th number <laughs> in the Fibonacci sequence. That's going to take a lot of time to calculate. It's certainly not going to happen in less than three seconds. So we've got to try and figure out how we can modify or do something interesting with this binary and, and poke at it. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I want to showcase an interesting technique that I'm pretty pleased with. Although I cannot take the credit myself, uh, a good friend of mine showed me this, but I think it's a very, very cool technique. So it's pretty script for this user bin environment Python. Let's do from pwn import all. I'm gonna be using pwn tools, and that's what I wanna showcase here. The pwn tools documentation covers an interesting thing that you can do with binaries, right? If you have an elf object, or you've created kind of just a file or a binary that you're working with within pwn tools, um, you have a function that's really neat called ASM and it will go ahead and assemble a specified instruction set, or the specified instructions, sorry, and insert them into the ELF or the binary at the specified address, address being the first argument, assembly being the second. This modifies the binary in place, I'm assuming that's meant to say in place, the resulting binary can be saved with ELF.save. So, that means we can essentially modify, change up, and do cool things with the binary. We can patch the binary and patch the program without having to have to deal with it in Hopper or Ida or anything else that may be kind of clunky with the dis disassembler and GUI stuff. Because I've tried to knob or like no off things out or part of the procedure and process has been ho Hopper. Um, and I would save a new executable and stuff like that, but it just would give me a seg fault and it just wouldn't work. So I think this is a really cool procedure and process. So be quick or be dead too. We've got the elf binary that we're working with here. Let's go ahead and run Python ape and 
Gotcha. So the check sec banner runs. Looks like we have partial row row, no stack canaries, but an X is enabled, so no executing off the stack, and no position independent code. That's fine. We don't care. We're not going to be dealing with that stuff in this video or with this binary or this challenge, but we want to actually take a look at what symbols we have, right? So if you wanted to, you could always check out the symbols that are actually present in a binary. You can just, you have elf.symbols as a dictionary. So let's do for um, key and address in elf.symbols iter tools, or iter items, I'm sorry. We can print out key and then the hex of the address. And if you wanted to, you could literally always get an idea of where things are in your program. So you can look at the procedural linkage table. You can look at the global offset table. You can see some of the functions that it's trying to call or work with, right? You can see get key, you can see decrypt flag, etc., and where they're located in the binary. So we can take advantage of this, right? And we can also just go ahead and patch things with that elf.assembly file to essentially remove that alarm call. Let's say I wanted to have elf.asm, so call this function with elf.symbols at the location of the alarm function, right? And let's say I don't want the alarm function to do anything else anymore. I want to make it useless, render it null and void. So what we can do is we can have the function go ahead and return. So simply do nothing. The instruction for that is just ret, right? And now that that's completed, we've essentially just said, the alarm function is not going to do anything else anymore. <laughs> After those three seconds, doesn't matter. We never even set up the alarm handler. Nothing's going to happen. So we'll go ahead and save this, right? We'll save it as a new binary, just like the documentation said. Now when we run the script, I have a new file, new, over here. And it's the same binary, but if we mark it as executable, go ahead and run it, it's going to try and calculate a key. And it's going to do this however long it takes because we're not going to get that three-second timeout. But we're still trying to calculate the 1,058 or whatever, in your case, uh, number in the Fibonacci sequence, right? <laughs> and that's going to take a long time. Certainly, certainly way too long. So let's see if we can patch this binary to also just have that number ready. Let's go ahead and see if we can figure out what that number is. Let's go ahead and Google, right? Let's. I, I've seen actually bigprimes.net, and that's where I actually ended up finding this earlier. Bigprimes.net, if you go there, it has an interesting archive of really cool numbers, Mersenne Prime, Prime numbers, formats, etc., and the Fibonacci archive. So if you were to click on one of these, you can view, oh, sorry, 1,000 Fibonacci number or whatever. You can view the specific page and specific number for any number in the sequence. So I'm going to change the URL, bring me to 1,058, and you can use whatever you need in your case. Um, and I will try to copy and paste this with my mouse just tweaking out on me. Please. Or whatever, I'll just create a new document and we'll cut it up. So this is the number. This is what we would have eventually calculated, right? Let's go ahead and create a variable for that. Let's just say number equals that. And let's try and patch the binary so the calculate key function no longer has to roll through all those Fibonacci oh, sequences. It'll I just think so cool the number and we'll say out of the box. calculate key no, will instead we'll just simply put this value into EAX, right? And let's use this percent S because we're just going to have to submit it in there. And then new line ret new line. So just instructions here on one line set EAX equal to our number. We're going to have to add that in as a format specifier and then return. So all it will do is yeah, immediately return that number. Assembly instruction we will have to so no format specify it with the percentage here. And we want that number in hex, for one thing. We also need to make it just a 32-bit number, something that will fit in that register. Yeah. So the way I'm going to do that is actually use the and sign, or ampersand, logical and, to crank it down to 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So all the way, just that, just that 32-bit here. So that will fit in the register. And now that that's calculated and done, cool, we've patched that function, we can save that, let's go ahead and run the script now, python ape, great, so now we still have our new binary here, let's run it, and just like that, we've got the correct key in place, and it can go ahead and print the flag for us, if we wanted to, we could streamline this, let's like import os, and then we could probably do os.system mod plus x new or something then we can run new right with uh, process dot slash new p dot 
receive all, ideally. Uh, we might have to wait for it to do things. Not true. Nope. Oh, the issue is I'm not printing out what I'm receiving. That would do it. Great. Okay, cool. So we can actually just get the last line here if we wanted to. Split that up. There's a new line at the very end, so we'll have to get the like second index. Cool. And then let's say context.log level equals critical, so we don't get all of that um, nonsense at the very top here. Great. So that means we have a successful get flag script. So we can chmod plus x that, run our get flag script, redirect that to a flag.txt file, and we can go ahead and copy that as well if we wanted to. I don't think I have xclip set up on this game. So let's move be quicker beat at two to complete. Mark that challenge as complete, and let's go ahead and submit the flag. All right. This challenge is the in and out error for 275 points. Okay. Um, yeah, business by four hours and seven minutes by improved cyber security skills with CTF CTF Walk to 2018 from John Hammond, hochgeladen auf dem freecodecamp.org channel. Und ähm, ich würde sagen, das war es dann äh, auch mit dieser Episode ähm, hier auf Lasergruppenland, dem Anarchie-Server ohne Regeln und ohne Spieler, wo ihr ähm, ganz frei seid mit der IP 149.202.127.134, alternativ auch mit der Domain sillyhuhn.com. Domain und IP ist wie immer in der Beschreibung, ebenso wie das Video, was wir hier angeschaut haben von dem freecodecamp.org-Channel. Okay, dann sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge.